Hello and welcome to the NAGT webinar, everyone. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in oops, strengthening work in earth education. Once I can get the slides right. Uh, webinars in this fe series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen, there's a link to the webinar series where you can find the schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can also find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, uh, through the webinar archives. Uh, before we get started, if you don't mind taking a quick look at the Zoom controls on the screen, we do ask that everyone leaves their microphones muted and video cameras off. Um, if you have questions and comments along the way, we do encourage you to enter those into the chat box. To access the chat box, find the Zoom control bar, and you might need to go to the more button and click on chat. And finally, a reminder to participants that uh, all, in all NHT meetings and events, that participants are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Uh, if you'd like to read the full NAGT code of conduct policy, you can find that linked in the chat uh, for more details. And uh, finally, today's webinar is titled Building Inclusive STEM Communities through partnership with students, the Being in STEM, Human in STEM, HSTEM initiative. Um, and it's being presented by Sarah Bonnell. And Sarah, at this point, I'll pass things off to you. Great. Um, thank you all so much for being here um, and for inviting me to share some of this work and to join you in thinking together about how we can build more inclusive STEM communities. Um, and how we can really leverage this time uh, as our institutions are thinking about what does inclusivity mean? How do we work with students in productive and positive ways? And what are the, the responsibilities and opportunities that we have in STEM uh, to make this work as impactful and positive as, as possible? Um, I wanted to, before I put my slides up, I just wanted to also link them in the chat so, um, so you have them, if that is more accessible to you in any way, um, just to add those there. Um, so please feel free to, to look at those, reference them, share them uh, if that's useful. And I'm gonna share my slides now. So let me know, and then I'm gonna move all these boxes around. All right, are we good? You see those? Perfect. It looks good. Great. Um, so again, thank you so much for inviting me to share this work. Uh, my name is Sarah Bennell. I'm the Associate Director and STEM Specialist for the Center for Teaching and Learning at Amherst College. Um, and I've been at Amherst for the last three years. Uh, and one of the big components of my work has really been focused on thinking about inclusive education and building inclusive communities. Uh, working through faculty development and faculty learning communities, but also thinking about assessment, uh, course design, and how do we make public uh, the good work that we are doing at our institutions. Um, and so that's really the, the lens that I'm bringing to share this with you, the Being Human in STEM initiative. Before we jump in, and I'll give you a sense of where we're going for the hour, um, we'd love to do just a little brief fun warm up uh, so if you wouldn't mind in the chat, adding um, a, an introduction of yourself. So a little Mad Lib, if you would. I am adjective that starts with the letter of your first name, last food that you ate. And I'll leave that there. Let me move this down. See what we got. Oh, kind Cheez-Its. <laughs> Pinky shrimp. Nice. Calm potatoes. 
enthusiastic almonds, phenomenal pretzel, patient soba, anxious cornbread, tall carrot. I feel like these could be good code names. <laughs> Lively yogurt, kind toast, a mulish salad, excellent. So if you haven't had a chance to add toasted cheese sandwich, thank you, um, please do. Um, it's nice to, to meet you all and to see you all in this space. Um, and I was struck, Stephanie and Mitchell shared with me the registrant information and some background. There is an incredible wealth of knowledge on this call um, and people doing some really amazing work. And so I hope we have an opportunity to learn from each other um, and to talk together about um, what we're thinking, what we're doing and, and how we can continue to do this work. So the plan for today, um, first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the being human in STEM model um, and how it got started. So talking about the being human in STEM initiative um, and then introducing our model of partnership, what really guides the work that we do. Um, I'm gonna talk a little about the H STEM course, which um, came out of this initial push. Um, and then I have two colleagues on the call, Dr. Phoebe Cohen and Dr. Michelle Markley um, from Williams and Mount Holyoke respectively, who have both taught the Being Human in STEM course at their own institutions and adapted them. Um, and they bring both geological expertise and also being human in STEM expertise. And so they're gonna share their reflections with us uh, about what they've learned through that process. And then um, the third part uh, of our time, I wanted to share some of the strategies that we've been using uh, in intro courses and across the sequence uh, to help to build more inclusive communities uh, and more engaged students and faculty um, I heard you when you said in that uh, webinar sign up, a number of people said, I don't need to be convinced that this is important. I want to hear about some things that I can plug into my classes in the spring. Um, and so we want to share some of those ideas and then also ask you to share out things that resonate with you um, that others might be able to adapt and employ as well. So that's our, our plan. Um, and before I jump into this, I want to acknowledge two really important um, co-partners in this work. Um, Sheila Jaswal, who's an associate professor of chemistry at Amherst and the originator of the Being Human in STEM initiative, and Megan Lister, who works at our Center for Community Engagement, um, who is a brilliant and compassionate mind. She has co-taught the H-STEM course every semester since the first semester. Um, and she brings community organizing expertise um, and a huge amount of empathy and wisdom to this work. Uh, and so I am one face and one voice today, but it is a team uh, behind all of it. So I wanted to just situate this talk um, a little bit in terms of thinking about the origins of the Being Human in STEM initiative, which really came from um, protests in fall of 2015, uh, where students at multiple institutions were conducting sit-ins protesting racial inequality and racial injustice at their institutions. Uh, and in response to this, we had three uh, Black sophomore uh, females at Amherst College who said, I need to do something too. Right? I'm not sure what that something is, but I feel like I'm in a position of relative power. And this affects us too with the college. Uh, and so these three women organized what was initially intended to be a one hour sit in at our library on uh, November 15th, 2015. It then led to a four day occupation uh, where students shared reflections about the ways in which they felt marginalized and not included in their educational experience or in the, the community at the college. Here are some of these images. Um, I want to point y'all to, uh, um, that's my Midwest roots, y'all's slip out. Um, I want to point y'all to the article that came out last year in Diversity and Democracy, the AACNU um, journal, where Sheila Jaswal talks about the origin 
of being human in STEM and talks about this protest if you'd like to hear more and to hear some student voices there. Um, and I want to share a couple of quotes from students uh, from that time. So some of the representative quotes um, in many social spaces where we're called to interact with each other, I'm always made aware of my black skin. I'm undocumented and a Latina and I find it hard to find my voice in small groups among three other, other Caucasian men. I've been forced to make a decision between doing well in my classes and feeling happily part of a community that embraces me for who I am. Um, Amherst, as um, some of you may know, we have invested heavily um, in uh, diversifying our student body. Um, and students called the college on that and said, we have been brought into a diverse community, but we do not feel like we are part of the community. We are, do not feel like we have what we need to thrive. Uh, and so in response, <coughs> really what's come out of this um, is what we call the being human in STEM ethos, which is a recognition that we need to partner with students to enact change and to move our institution towards a more inclusive set of practices. Uh, but we cannot partner if we don't start up at the top with listening, that we needed to actively listen to our students. We needed to listen to what they were saying, what they were telling us about their experience that needed to be followed by validation, that their experience was true to them, that it was authentic and real and meaningful, uh, that that is followed by a process of reflecting where we reflect on how this connects to our own lived experience, um, to our own positionality and to the privileges that many of us carry in having different experiences um, than what students are bringing forward. And it is only by moving through that uh, series of steps starting with and guided by listening that we can authentically partner with students. And so following the sit-in, Louise Ataja, who is now a medical student, um, she wrote a letter to all of the faculty and all of the STEM departments at the college, um, asking them to show up, asking them to do something um, and saying, we need to recognize that these voices um, are part of our community and we need to do better. Um, so this is part of her letter. She says, as, part of, as both a woman and a student of color, I have felt loneliness and isolation in a field devoid of mentors who've gone through similar experiences and could support me in the challenges of taking on a STEM major. I feel compelled to write this letter because of my respect and love for the STEM field as well as the Amherst community. So she came from a place of feeling connected to the community and wanting to work with faculty and staff to think about how are we gonna respond and how is this going to manifest itself in the curriculum and in the intercurricular spaces. In response, every STEM letter wrote, or every STEM department wrote a letter in support of students. Um, and this is only a, a representation um, of these letters um, and snapshots of them and many other departments beyond STEM, um, and many staff offices did as well. Um, one of the things that I have done is to look through these letters for themes um, because we are not post uprising. We are not post uh, racial challenge. We are dealing with this intensely on all of our, our campuses and in our institutions and spaces and homes. Uh, and so thinking about how did these groups respond? What were the commonalities? What were the themes that emerged? And I wanted to share these with you all because I often get asked, what should we say? What is the right response? And I don't know what the right response is, but I can share some, some common themes and I can share some things that really have resonated with our students. Uh, and so some of the common features of these departmental letters in response to the student protest. Um, first, almost all letters said we support the protest or we support the action, we support the initiative, right? We stand in solidarity with our students. Um, most letters also express a general commitment to change. Right? that we see that there are changes that need to, to happen and we're committed to those changes. Often individuals reflected on how this kind of conversation leads them to recommit to their mission, right? That at our core, we are educators. 
Um, Brian Dewsbury, who we'll talk about in a little bit, often says, he's a biologist um, at the University of Rhode Island. He often says, I don't teach biology, I teach students biology, right? That this kind of moment can affirm for us, what is our core mission to support students uh, and to help them thrive? And that they need emotional validation, right? That their experience of pain and exhaustion uh, is real and meaningful and important. But there are two other things that came up in these letters that may be helpful for you all as you are having these conversations at your own home communities. Um, two things that students have said are particularly helpful and important and resonant with them, but were not present in the vast majority of responses from departments. The first one was acknowledging that we have failed. Right? And to say that explicitly, we understand that we have failed in our commitment in the past we promise to listen and respond to the concerns of every one of our students. That is a hard thing for anyone to do. That is a hard thing to state as a department that has been an incredibly meaningful message for students to hear on our campus. And the other is to articulate specific actions that you will take forward. Um, so to move beyond a general commitment to change, to articulate, here's what we are committing to do, because it is only through those specific commitments that we can be held accountable. Uh, and students see that and they value that. So out of this fall, um, out of these conversations emerged the Being Human in STEM course or the H STEM course. Um, so the course started in spring 2016. Um, Sheila Jaswal was the first instructor of that course. It was a special topics course with nine students. Um, and the courses each semester, it's now been taught eight times at Amherst, um, each semester the specifics change a little bit, but the general structure is the same, uh, which is that we focus first on building community, and we're going to talk about community building practices and why that's so important. The second phase is research, uh, that it is an academic orientation to inclusivity but it is an academic orientation that both privileges the academic literature around diversity, inclusion and equity work, uh, particularly focused in STEM or perhaps even in sub-disciplines, depending upon who your group is in the course, um, but also an academic orientation towards lived experience, collecting of narrative, which includes autobiographical narrative. Right? What has been my experience in STEM? What is my life course? What, has, what factors have contributed to that that I have not interrogated? Uh, and how do other individuals make sense of their own narrative and their own path? And how do I bring that into conversation with the literature? And then it is only once we have engaged in this research that we can use that to translate it into suggested action. So the third phase of the course, and one that I think is particularly important, um, is to really think about how do we help empower students to make change? Uh, but how do we help empower them to make change in ways that are sustainable and reasonable and around the area that they most care about? Um, so across these different courses, we've seen a wide range of action projects that students have developed. I'm gonna share some of them. Um, Michelle is also gonna speak to an example. Phoebe has some really rich examples. Um, so thinking about how do we empower students to make targeted efforts of change to create the communities that they value. And then how do we reach out and recognize that what we are doing in one course connects to what so many of you all are doing broadly. Uh, so how do we expand the conversation? Um, I wanted to ground this a little bit specifically just to give you an example of what that actually means. So this is a visual representation of our spring 2020 age STEM course. Um, so you'll see we did, again, the first week of community building. Um, you can see the topics up in the top left that we talked about week two through five. Um, one of the things that was really great about this course um, this semester is that it was taught both by uh, a STEM faculty member, but also a sociologist, it was co-taught. And so thinking about those different lenses on knowledge, what counts as truth, how do I know something, um, really enriched the dynamic and the literature that they engaged with. Uh, they conducted oral histories, uh, 
right? There were campus project proposals, those action projects, and a number of speakers, what you see over on the right-hand side, um, were really important in connecting out. Just to give some examples, and I linked the slides at the beginning. So all of these have hyperlinks that I, the link that I shared with you all. So you can dive in whatever feels most important or interesting to you. Um, but these are links to different student action projects that have come out of the course, um, including outreach to local elementary schools uh, and thinking about how do we diversify elementary education um, and what does inclusive elementary education look like. Um, conducting alumni interviews, staff interviews, um, collecting those narratives, right, to really create an archive of lived experience. Um, students often have focused on building workshops around HSTEM to try to reach out more globally. If you wanted to create an HSTEM course or an HSTEM workshop, what might you do? Uh, and then the product that has been the most resonant for us um, on our campus has been the HSTEM curricular handbook which is a series of practices, uh, pedagogical practices and tools that students identified through interviews and surveys with other students in STEM. What are the things that help you feel included in class, that help you feel like you belong in lab? What are the things that feel off-putting to you or distancing to you in STEM? Um, and how can we build a set of practices that we can then share more broadly? Um, so the HSTEM curricular handbook, again, that students generated and we have refined over time is something that we share with incoming faculty every year. We reference it um, and incorporate these practices in courses way beyond our HSTEM courses, but throughout the STEM curriculum. Um, so if you'd like access to that, you can get a link to that too. Just a couple of reflections. Um, about what participating in something like this can do. Um, so here's a, a quote from a recent student um, who participated in HSTEM. Uh, they say, Amherst students hear about how to be part of a diverse community in an abstract, abst excuse me, abstract sense, but this didn't often get put into practice. Being human in STEM helped me put my beliefs into play. As a woman in STEM, I had moments to speak up, and as a white and financially privileged person in STEM, I had moments to elevate the voices of others, right? Learning about positionality and intersectional, intersectional identities and what are the ways in which we need to attend to those. And then faculty and staff have also shared really broad impacts um, of this work. Um, so one individual who participated in HSTEM for a number of years has said, um, I had many moments of uncomfortable self-reflection during which I had to grapple with my own privilege and positionality in ways I hadn't before. The impact of those experiences extends far beyond HSTEM and has helped me become a more reflective and curious human. And then another faculty member wrote, as a consequence of HSTEM, I've made a deliberate decision to, to share with students stories about my own failures and moments of doubt. I'm a junior faculty member and I'm the only female faculty member in my department in a field where women are underrepresented. Participating in the HSTEM initiative has increased my awareness not only of the importance of inclusivity in my classroom, but also of the importance of building a community for myself. So the HSTEM course model has spread um, in ways that we are really excited about. Um, so a number of institutions have taken this model and adapted it um, to think about how it fits with their own curricular structure, their student needs, the challenges that they're facing. Um, and so this is something that we encourage you, if you are thinking about um, courses that may engage students in partnership and conversation, please take what resonates with you. Let us know, um, because we'd love to be partners with you in that. And so we have two partners here with us today um, to share their own experience uh, participating and teaching an HSTEM course at their institution. Um, so Dr. Michelle Markley, who's a professor of geology at Mount Holyoke, uh, and Dr. Phoebe Cohen, an associate professor of geosciences at Williams College, um, have joined us to share their perspectives um, on teaching an HSTEM course and on thinking about this kind of work um, from the lens of 
uh, of, of the geosciences and the lens of, of people who care deeply about inclusive teaching. So I'm going to stop screen sharing for now so that we can see our colleagues on the screen. Perfect. Great. Nice tech work. Amazing. Um, so, so Phoebe, maybe I'll just start with you and we'll, we'll tag team. Um, but I wonder if you'd be willing to share a little bit about what your motivations were for joining HSTEM and for teaching an HSTEM course. Why were you interested in this work? Sure. Um, so I have been interested in uh, JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues in STEM for most of my academic career and um, have long been interested in finding ways to incorporate it more into the teaching that I do. Um, and bringing it to undergraduates, in part because I feel like when I was a graduate student, I didn't have the vocabulary to understand my own experiences, never mind the experiences of those um, who um, have other minoritized identities. Um, and I really wish that I had had that experience as a graduate student and, and definitely didn't know anything about it as, a, as an undergraduate, really. Um, so some of that just comes from my own personal experience. And then also just from the observations of, of, of seeing my students and their struggles and their experiences at Williams. Um, and so I, I co-taught it with um, Savan Carell, who taught it when he was a postdoc at Yale, um, who's in physics. Um, and that was really wonderful to have that interaction with, with him and with someone with a different background, with someone from a different um, scientific discipline. Um, and so that was the motivation. So we taught it uh, last fall, fall 2019, for the first time to 13 students. Great, thanks so much. And Michelle, what brought you to, to HSTEM? What were you hoping to accomplish in teaching that course? Oh, it's interesting to listen to Phoebe because I thought about some things that probably contributed that I hadn't thought about before. But I was um, invited by junior colleagues in chemistry and in my own department to attend an HSTEM, um, the one at Yale. So there, there's a conference often where the students get together at the end of the semester and do poster presentations for each other. And I think it was three or four years ago now that I attended one just out of curiosity because it just seemed like such a, I'm really interested in equity issues generally um, in academia. And, uh, and, and then when I got there and I talked to all the students about their projects, I was just like, oh my God, like, this is amazing. These students have done amazing work. It was really fun to talk to them. Um, and also just to think we should be teaching, but somebody should do this at Mount Holyoke. And then it became clear that for various reasons, it might as well be me. <laughs> so that then I went and pushed to be able to teach it and try to get the ball rolling with it. So, um, but I was listening to you, Phoebe, thinking when I was a graduate student, I took a, a sort of a half class that was for women in STEM with um, a woman who had been hired as Dean and had actually reverted to the geology department, but it was super useful just to read up on the literature and find out that it wasn't my imagination. And there were all these other women and we were all just like, oh my God, it's not our imagination. It was women from all these fields. And um, I had sort of put that in my back pocket and forgot about it. But when I started to think about HSTEM, I really started to think about how helpful it is to, to understand that you're not alone. A lot of people are experiencing these same things. And, you know, and as you say, a lot of people are experiencing diff, you know, it differently from different angles. But so that was also quite motivating is realizing how important that very small experience had been for me in graduate school. Yeah, thank you for bringing that forward because we hear that so much from students, right? That um, to recognize that they are not carrying this burden, they're not making it up. Um, and that actually there are some systemic challenges and institutionalized challenges um, that we need to work together to problematize and problem solve. Um, and that to feel as though um, they are in community and that their truths are real um, is incredibly validating and incredibly important um, for students who otherwise may be lost um, to the STEM space. Um, so Phoebe, you talked a lot about, um, in our conversation earlier, about 
thinking about how you bring this course to an institution um, and both the, the rewarding aspects of that and also some of the challenges of that work. Would you mind speaking to that for us? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate in that um, my department was extremely supportive, um, but I did teach it as an overload. And so one of the things I'm working on now is uh, building a cohort of faculty at Williams uh, moving forward, um, because I think it is done best as a, as a, as a team taught experience with folks from different disciplines. So I think that sustainability piece is huge, even if there is sort of, you know, support verbally, oh, sure, this is great, we'll cross list this or whatever. But turning that into actual FTE time when we all have many other teaching commitments, I think is challenging. Um, and, you know, but the experience for me was just so interesting and rewarding. Um, I learned a huge amount about the experience of students, especially in our large intro courses. Um, and most of it was bad. <laughs> And I think that was really um, revelatory for me, especially because we our, our intercourses tend to be smaller and less sort of weed out. Um, and so I, I think that I, I learned a lot about, um, it was sort of frustrating to me because I felt like it was sort of beyond my control, but it was also very motivating to be like, okay, well, how can I make, you know, the geoscience courses that we teach um, really, uh, we, how can we elevate them in terms of incorporating um, best practices for inclusive teaching into our own courses. And then, you know, in a, in a larger sense, how can we work as, a, as an institution to improve the experience of students in our large introductory courses? And so I think I really be became aware of the barriers that many of our students face in a way that I hadn't um, previously. Um, and they really, students really opened up in a way that they normally do not in sort of a normal academic course. Um, and you know there were there were many challenges. I think one of the challenges was helping students to feel empowered, while also not giving them a false sense of agency. Um, you know our institutions are or many of them are old and slow to change, even the ones that are sort of labeled as progressive, um, and that's very frustrating for students. And I totally understand that frustration. So I often found myself in the position of sort of defending the institution that we're all talking about trying to change, which was uncomfortable for me. Um, but also I think a valuable experience for me too, to hear their anger, their justified anger. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in part of those conversations, right, one of the things that we have um, struggled with a little bit is that same sense of defensiveness um, and recognizing that changes have happened, um, but they are slow and they are not big enough. Uh, and so how do we recognize the growth that has happened at our institutions while also holding ourselves more accountable? Um, and students live with us for four years. Uh, and so as they move in and out of this space, their time zone um, and their, their time scale is much smaller than institutional time scale. Uh, and so, right, so helping them see those changes and recognize- Yeah, and even just educating them on how hiring works. You know, like in, in, a, in an institution, but also like what are the federal laws around hiring? So there, there was a lot of education that happened in terms of just how institutions are run that I think was really interesting to students, um, kind of seeing behind the scenes in a way that most students never really, really experience if they don't end up working, you know, in admissions or something like that. So, right, right, right. And Michelle, you have done some, some great reflecting about how teaching HSTEM impacts how you think about teaching other courses um, and how you think about geology more broadly and your role as a, a geoscience educator. Um, would you mind sharing some of those connections and, and thoughts with us? Oh, you are muted at the moment. I just chatted out a link to one of the um, really sort of well-developed HSTEM student projects that came out of the course that I taught in the spring. Um, and so my one of my groups of students put together just a whole bunch of ideas and resources to do little mini workshops in 100 level STEM classrooms related to implicit bias, stereotype threat, microaggressions, um, and also the sort of Brian Dewsbury type, this I believe like value statements basically that, um, that turn out to be really motivating and interesting and uh, 
So, um, so one of the things I started doing this year in geology was I've been running the mini workshops in my plate tectonics class um, off and on, and you know, giving students credit for them. And it's been a, it, it's been really interesting to even take the baby steps in those classes in geology because it, it's so far been super well received by the students in my classes um, who've been really positive about it. You know, we should be doing this all the time. This is so great you're doing this. Like I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to people about it. We do um, community guidelines for the classroom and stuff like that based on these workshops. And uh, so that's been really neat. And it's also been a little mind numbing. Um, the response from a surprising number of colleagues is, and when you start to do this kind of work, you end up finding out stuff about your colleagues that it's really unfortunate. And, and it, there's a lot of, um, the positionality is, can be really difficult. Uh, but Phoebe and I were talking, we had a mini call and I was saying, one of the things like when I taught my HSTEM class, I only had one geology major in it. So I had students from all the STEM fields, but geology was not well represented in my class. And um, even in sort of reading all the literature and talking with students, I feel like geology has a lot of the same issues as other disciplines in STEM. But in addition, we have really serious issues with um, field representation of people in the field, um, risk that people feel doing field work and really extended field trips. Um, and, and I think there's um, a sort of an extra level of issues that geology faces, especially very traditional curricula um, in geology face in terms of sexual harassment and field studies. Um, and, and those sexual harassment issues are uh, very intersectional for a lot of students. So that, that's just some of my reflection. It's really changed the way I think about it because I'm a field geologist and um, it's only quite recently that I've started to appreciate uh, really what those challenges are and to start to grapple with what it would mean to change the culture there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and a process, right? An ongoing process, um, I think. You know, as we have looked at, for instance, those departmental letters, um, it is not that we are always going to say or do the right thing, um, but it is that we are willing to move into uncomfortable conversations and to reflect on ourselves um, and where we have space for growth. And can we invite students uh, and other institutional partners into that conversation? Um, looking at the chat, if there are pressing questions that anyone has at this point, um, either for myself or Michelle and Phoebe, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, I'm going to shift gears in just a minute and talk about some concrete strategies and some ideas and then want to leave it open for a broader discussion too. Um, but want to make sure if there's anything that people wanted to get on the table at this moment, please do. Oh, question about this course for high school students. Um, so to my knowledge, Sheila Jaswell's on the call. So please, Sheila, pipe up if you know of others. Um, my sense is that there's been workshops, um, high school-based workshops around HSTEM, but not a full course. That's correct, okay. <laughs> Um, yes, but I could see this readily translating. Um, and we um, we are happy to share any and all of it. So syllabi, reading, structures, the website, the beinghumanandstem.com website um, is a great place for all of those resources. So please dig in and, and see what resonates with your context. I can jump in. There's another question about uh, having the course count as a major and um, the student's experience of marginalization. Um, so we had our course was cross-listed in physics and geoscience and then our um, science technology studies departments. Um, and so it counted as a course, but it was not a course toward the major. Um, and in part that was because it was the first time that had been taught. So I think it was sort of like, you know, an experiment and we have, uh, we're at a liberal arts school. So there's only nine required courses for a geoscience major. And so the decision was made that um, while it would be a, you know, a course that students would get full credit for, it wouldn't necessarily count towards the major. And so the, 
that's definitely an interesting, you know, you don't want things, you don't want it to fall through the cracks and you want it to be appealing to students. And so I think that's one of the arguments for um, making sure that you're incorporating these kinds of things into all of your classes, right? Um, so that students don't have to take us, you know, obviously I think the separate course does have a lot of value, but in addition, trying to find ways to integrate this material into, um, you know, hopefully, you know, all of the courses that we teach the way Michelle was talking about it. And um, the marginalization thing, I think it, you know, there were a lot of really difficult conversations in the classroom and students were, you know, it was bringing up a lot for them. And so, um, you know, as Sarah and, and Michelle both mentioned, setting ground rules and building trust at the beginning of the course was really essential. Um, and I think in some ways it made students feel better in terms of reducing their sense of isolation, understanding that there's a whole body of literature and research about the things that they're experiencing. But I think also some of it was really hard, um, you know, to see the statistics and to see the studies and to see, you know, this is my identity and, and um, you know, no progress has been made. So I think that for, for my students, there was definitely a mix of comfort and also um, in some cases increased alienation, I think. So. Mm -hmm. We do have, in terms of it, adding it into the curriculum um, for a major, um, this last spring, um, some of the students in our Being Human and STEM course were biology majors um, and wrote to the department um, in response to their initial departmental letter and said, here are the things that we haven't seen come through um, and here are the things we still need to feel successful in the major. Um, and the department responded in a very positive partnering way. Um, and in one departmental meeting decided to add a diversity requirement to the major and HSTEM counts as one of those courses towards the major. Um, so really a, a pretty massive shift in terms of thinking about the time scale that departments move. Thank you, Sheila, for adding the link to the, the biology department. Um, I told you it's a team, man, and she's an amazing teammate. Um, and, and so thinking about when change can happen, when the energy is there and when an institution or a department is ready, change can happen fast when we listen to students. Uh, and so, um, so I think that there are, there are some real opportunities um, that are possible. Okay, so I'm sensitive to time and also want to just open it up more broadly at the end for discussion. So I wanted to, as I said, spend a little bit of time talking about some concrete strategies that you all might consider or maybe you're already using in your classes to build inclusive community. Um, and again, as I went through the registrant list um, of the people who are on this call, you're just a phenomenal group of thoughtful, reflective people who are already taking this on. Um, from multiple lenses of leadership. So in no way is this to claim that this, these are the only things that we can do or should do or, or could be doing. And so I've created a Google Doc um, for community building activities. So as we talk through these activities, if there are other things that you're doing that you think help to build a more inclusive community in your classroom that others could learn from, please drop it in here. Um, and then we'll share this out with everybody who's on the call so we can get a larger list of ideas and strategies. Um, so please feel free to share if that's something that, um, that you feel energized and uh, willing to do. So I'm gonna jump into my slides and then we'll come back um, for some questions at the end. Okay. All right, um, so I wanna talk about, as I said, some strategies. This is my working definition of what I think we should be doing, at least what guides my own work um, as I think about inclusive STEM communities, uh, that it needs to happen on two levels, that we foster authentic relationships with each other. And we emphasize the fact that we are whole human beings with all of that lived experience and baggage, um, and that we are scientists who are humans first. Uh, and so how do we bring that into a space in community? How do we build those relationships? Um, but at the same time, we need to build communities that people want to belong to. Uh, and so how do we work within institutional structures and departmental structures and cross-institutional structures and disciplinary boundaries? How do we push 
um, so that it is a community that students want to be a member of, that our HSTEM course or our small advising circle or wherever it is we have contact and control is not the only safe space for students. How do we build a larger geoscience community or STEM community that is a community where students feel like they are represented, that they belong, and they're included and safe? So here are a couple of strategies that, again, these are all talked about in the Being Human in STEM handbook, um, but we wanted to share these, um, a couple of examples that may resonate with you as you think towards the spring. Um, so first off, one thing that we do in all of our courses, and, and as Michelle said, now in courses way beyond just the HSTEM course, um, is to have a conversation about class norms, right? What are the ways that we will work together um, so that we feel valued and included? Um, and a set of prompts that you can use to spark this conversation, um, qualities or values that you want to ask of our group, right, as we work together, and what are the qualities and values that you will offer the group. Um, you can see these paper plates are where students wrote these down in the past spring semester. It's shaped as a heart because it's a heart. Um, and then students, um, uh, several students took what emerged from that discussion and created a poster, um, a visual representation that you can come back to throughout the semester. Let's make sure that we are affirming and valuing um, these shared goals and norms for our community. And when a norm is violated, we can reference the norm, not the person, right? Um, that it feels like we are in a difficult space where we are not fully practicing mindfulness, right? Um, that we are um, taking up too much space. Right. And so how do we reconnect and recenter our norms within the conversation? So it can be a guiding principle um, for conversation. Another strategy or um, tool that you may um, use or already be using um, that we use in all of our Being Human in STEM courses is the H-STEM or Being Human in STEM story to share your own story. And so all participants in the class, staff, faculty, and students write and then share their own story. Um, and so you're reflecting on what, what has happened in my own life, in my own journey in STEM. What role has STEM played in my life? What are those important experiences that stick out to me? What's most engaging or enjoyable about STEM? What do I wanna learn more about? Um, how does this connect with my future self? And so these prompts are written in a student focused way, um, but you could adapt them readily for a faculty or staff um, position. Um, and all of us write these stories and again, share them with each other so that we can learn about each other in terms of how we've moved through STEM um, and how we're thinking about ourselves in that journey. I wanna give you just a couple of examples real briefly about what these look like because you can do them visually, they can be written. Um, here are a couple of visual examples. Um, so here's one st student story in STEM, um, right, was interested in math, always good at it, never fell in love with it, um, really music, my greatest passion, but there's no money, um, dreamed of being a doctor, failed high school chem, um, wanted to break an Asian stereotype, so I did know more STEM, um, right, so thinking about these, the journey and the processing um, and asking students to do that kind of processing. Here's another messier example, um, right? That students were, uh, this student was thinking about, if you see on the left in red, geology, field work, conservation, crystal research, um, going to grad school, struggling with physics, right? Not happy with their GRE physics score, but they're spending more time in lab. So thinking about these different, these different processes or it can be in written form. So this is an example student um, HSTEM narrative, the section of it, anonymized, um, where this student says, throughout my life, I've always been interested in computers. My mom taught me how to use the computer at the age of three. Um, they talk about enjoying them a lot and then also finding out they could be educational. My mother supported me in this because we both stay up late playing computer games together. It really brought us, brought us together. There were only two times I was reminded that being a woman of color in computer science had its downsides. One time was when I went to the computer science club on campus. There were only three of us there, two white men and me. I was trying to tell one of the white men that his answer was incorrect for 20 minutes and he wouldn't believe me. 
few minutes later, the other white man said he was wrong. So they gave the same explanation as I did and the white man believed him. And I never went back to computer science club. The other instance was when I was taking my comprehensive exam. While I was trying to explain my answers, one of the professors kept cutting me off before I could finish speaking. He'd suck his teeth and shake his head if I said something wrong. Not only did this increase my anxiety, but it was the first time a professor, someone I looked up to made me feel stupid. And as if I didn't belong as a computer science major, I still think about this experience to this day, right? So students are really thinking about um, these deep moments, these transitions, these turns in their life course um, and bringing these into conversation again with the literature and with their understanding of STEM. Um, Michelle referenced the This I Believe essay, and this is something that I um, highly endorse as a practice if it's something that you haven't already used. Um, and it's something, again, that Brian Dewsbury, who is a HSTEM listening partner um, and strong HSTEM advocate, um, talks about. The link in the slides will take you to the guidelines and the prompt for this assignment if you want to look more at it. Um, but it is asking students in 500 words um, to write about what they deeply believe and value. What is your daily life philosophy and what has shaped your beliefs? Um, and Brian asks all of his intro students, he typically has 150 um, students in introductory biology to write this before they come to class on day one and he reads every one. So he has a sense of who are the humans in the room and then we can start from a place of community because he's already started to get to know them. There are also some strategies for creating community in lab that I wanted to reference. Um, and we have an article coming out in the International Journal for Students as Partners that talks about the efficacy of this work um, and how it's impacting students likely retention in STEM. Um, so I will uh, please reach out if that's something you'd like once it, it goes to print. Um, but there are a couple of things that we do. Um, first off, rotating lab partners. Um, and rotating lab partners every week um, so that students are working with new individuals. Um, and we use trading cards, scientists trading cards with um, information and an image of an underrepresented scientist. Um, you could do this within your own discipline and then students match up the trading cards. So they are shuffled and handed out and you match your card and that identifies your lab partner. Um, also in terms of lab reports, asking students at the end of every lab write-up or lab report to do some reflecting on group process. If this is an important skill around building community, then we need to practice it and prioritize it. Um, so these are some of the prompts that we've used. Um, what behaviors from yourself or your partners enhanced your experience? What did you do well in your group this week? What did your partner do well in your group this week? And then we often add a fourth question, which is, what do I want to work on and focus on in my group next week? What is my forward-facing intention for being in solid community with my colleagues? Um, and then finally, and this is a real low-hanging fruit, community announcements in lab that at the start of lab or as you begin um, an activity this uh, in the next week, um, you ask students to announce what's happening in your own community that is not STEM related. What are you doing? Are you performing in a musical? Are you working on a particular piece of art? Um, are you visiting a friend's show? Are you going to see a particular um, play or movie or artist that you're interested in? Are you working on something else? Um, so asking them to report out about what's important and interesting to them and making space for that at the start of each lab. So those are some examples. Again, if you look at the, the handbook, you can dive more. And I hope there's a phenomenal group of accumulating resources in our crowdsource document. Um, at the end of the slides that I shared, there's links to all sorts of these resources. So the Being Human in STEM website, there's a Being Human in STEM documentary that one of our student partners created. Uh, there's a link right there to the curricular practice handbook. Um, and prompts for writing your own being human in STEM story. And at this, I'd like to just stop and open it up to additional questions, conversation, things that resonate with you, things that are you're troubling you. Um, and I wanna thank you for your time and, and engaging with this. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and I just want to um, 
uh, Sheila pointed out that we actually don't have editing abilities of the sh shared documents. I don't know. Oh, no. Um, uh, can do that. And then um, there was a question earlier that I wanted to go back to about field work. And so maybe sh Michelle could uh, maybe answer, if, you know, um, where did anyone choose like a, a mini project, um, you know, about how to make field work more inclusive or what are your own ideas maybe about how to make field work more inclusive? Um, so I had my HTEM class was the students really drove the projects and I had only one actually even the geology major who took the class was not field oriented so we paid no attention to field oriented um, projects but when I put together my reading list um, I did quite a bit of tweaking from the usual HTEM because I teach at a women's college it's gender diverse but it's a women's college so um, I felt like I needed a sort of a different slant. Um, and, and, and by removing a whole bunch of the women in STEM material, actually from the basic HTEM sort of protocols, I was able to put in a whole bunch of stuff that other people haven't been doing very much. And one of the things was I did a fair amount of reading on disability in STEM. Um, and so that was really eye-opening for me was even pulling together these readings and thinking. And so that's been a place where I've made a lot of progress. And also just from some really big fails over the past decade, basically, um, is just, I mean, and these are just anecdotal, like what I do now. So if I I'm, have evolved into somebody who, when I take my students into the field, I'll only take a van full of students to an outcrop that you can literally drive up to and park and there's the rocks right there. Like, and it's really limited some of the stuff we see, but I, I just feel like I've had enough experiences that, that have been really exclusionary that I feel like if this is gonna be where students are learning how to describe a rock, take a strike and dip, you know, take a sample or whatnot, that any of those added layers of access and difficulty I just want to avoid them at all costs. I want it to be the most like, if you're uncomfortable, I bring extra coats, like if it's cold. So I have really moved towards um, that kind of model in my own teaching over the past decade, really strongly. Um, but I, I, and so, I mean, Mount Holyoke doesn't have a required field camp, but uh, I think it's a, a place that really needs some attention. And I know there's a raging debate in the geology community right now about the sort of usefulness of mandatory field camp and other kinds of field camps. And, and I, I feel that, that that's a place where um, some creative thinking about different kinds of camps would really help a lot because it's very much the case that lots of geologists don't do field work anymore. And, and well, I think the, the pandemic has um, really forced the, yeah. forced the hand of many a department yeah. in terms of thinking about how virtual field trips or other kinds of research experiences can be just as, if not more valuable than the traditional field experience. So yeah, that's a good um, point. I, I, do you mind if I answer Sarah, the question in the chat? Cause it's- um, Yeah, please. Yeah, so um, I guess Sheila kind of answered it already but I'll just say from my own perspective, um, yeah, I am not an expert on feminist philosophy although I did take a feminist philosophy course in college or post-colonial and native perspectives on science. So, um, the way we approached that was that when we entered the classroom, we talked about our own backgrounds and um, our own our own experiences and our own sort of intellectual backgrounds. And we said, you know, we are learners in this course with you. Um, and so we saw our role much more as facilitators um, and guides rather than instructors. Um, and so the way we structured our course was that we picked readings for the first um, half of the course and then students picked readings for the second half of the course. Um, and that was really wonderful because they were able to bring their own expertise or interests to the group. Um, and so, yeah, so we didn't try to be experts. Um, and I would say that, you know, I think I learned just as much, if not more, um, as the students did um, from the readings and discussions that we had. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for addressing that too. And I think you know, one of the things that we really try to stress in this work um, is that, yeah, even in, in 16 weeks or 13 weeks, this is not all, uh, we are not going to have all of the answers or enact all of the change. Um, and that hopefully what we are doing is that we are inspiring 
ourselves and we are inspiring our students to continue to think, um, to ask questions, to want to know more, to delve into the literature, and so that this becomes an ongoing process of critical inquiry um, and that is part of their toolbox of becoming a scientist. Yeah, and like Michelle, I mean, I, I didn't have a lot of understanding of like what the structure of a traditional HSEM course was. So we kind of just did our own thing. Um, and so we did a week on, on harassment in STEM and did focus on the geosciences. None of the projects focused on that, but we did read a bunch of articles and um, personal experiences. I also, we also incorporated, you know, things like podcasts into, um, into the course. So it wasn't just all, all articles. So, um, yeah, again, I didn't have a lot of geology. I only had one geology student in my course as well, but we definitely talked about how different areas of STEM have unique challenges. Yeah, I'll just say, I think it's not very native to us as scientists who teach undergrads is um, the sort of humanities type model where you sit around a seminar table and everybody leads, right? You choose the next person who talks. And I definitely did that with discussions in my HSEM class. So I, I wasn't up there pretending any sort of authority. In fact, I had a handful of students who, um, I found that, that the psych ed department at my institution is full of amazing people doing amazing work and teaching amazing things. And I had students who were, had taken some of those courses and really had strong thoughts, lots of skills who uh, I, I would say if anything were in some ways more leaders, like um, more generous leaders in the class than I was. And I was overjoyed to, to let everybody, you know, run the show. Um, I, you know, so I, I would, I, I would encourage you to really, you know, put together some a structure and then be a student too. I mean, you have to step up sometimes and take responsibility for some things, but um, it's it's a pretty neat experience to talk about it. Talk about a whole bunch of stuff with students and really hear people's experiences and share your own and yeah. So I am sensitive to our time. I really want to thank both uh, Phoebe and Michelle for joining us today. Um, and for all of you uh, for taking the time in a very busy time. Um, I hope that there are some things that resonate with you. Please reach out um, if you have questions or if we can be, um, if we can be helpful for additional resources um, or ideas. So thank you all very much. And Sarah, I'd also like to thank you as well as Phoebe and, and Michelle for for doing this webinar today. It's been really fantastic. I've certainly learned a lot and it seems like everyone in the audience has gained a lot too. Um, I thank you to our audience for, for joining us. Um, we will have a recording and the webinar slides posted to the webinar event page. Um, I put a link to that in the chat box. Um, and I'll also quick make a note, if you're uh, having a few extra minutes today to take our webinar evaluation survey, we do always appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, so if you don't mind filling that out, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, and again, thank you all for attending today. I can archive the chat um, because I know there are some good resources in there, so we can make sure to save that. <laughs>